Pyramids of Mars brings us yet another story with our TARDIS duo as the Doctor attempts to make his way back to London to bring Sarah Jane home, but this time they find themselves slightly off course in the right place but the wrong time. This is a story I have always enjoyed, I first saw it many years ago and re-watching it for this review was I think my third time experiencing this serial. And this is one of those Doctor Who stories that just seems to get better every time I watch it. I really enjoyed the opening that sets the stage for this story with the character of Marcus on this archaeological expedition. The character himself superstitious savage. He isn't the most sympathetic, and for the purposes of the story he really doesn't need to be. I've mentioned before in my video on the Tomb of the Cybermen that I do quite enjoy archaeological expeditions when they are used as a part of a story. I can't imagine why. And while this serial isn't much like that Cyberman tale, it's similarly a nice starting place. The threat of the story is found right at the beginning in the Egyptian tomb, and I'll try to avoid getting too far into spoilers, but I am going to consider a good deal of the first part fair game as it lays the groundwork for the entire serial. When we first see our main characters, we find the Doctor in an unusually dour mood. Sarah Jane tries to cheer him up and it doesn't seem to really work all that much. He definitely seems to be having something of a midlife crisis. But unsurprisingly, the story interjects that conversation and manages to wrap our characters up in the events transpiring in 1911. I am curious if this is something the show is actually going to touch back on or not, because it doesn't get much of a resolution inside of this story. But I do really like how Sarah Jane does try to cheer the Doctor up at the beginning. That was nice to see. I'm a Time Lord. Oh, I know you're a Time Lord. You don't understand the implications. I'm not a human being. I walk in eternity. What's that supposed to mean? It means I've lived for something like 750 years. Oh, you'll soon be middle-aged. Yes! I really enjoy the main setting of this serial where most everything happens either inside the mansion or the surrounding forest because they are on location for a great deal of the serial filmed at Stargrove Manor, which was apparently owned by McDagger at the time, so that's something, I guess. And this forest was so beautiful and luscious, and it was just a nice backdrop for the entire story, and it is the case where it helps to contribute to a quite specific style of the serial. I think the setting is really important in an episode, and though our main characters are confined by a barrier inside of a limited area, it doesn't feel too claustrophobic, which contrasts greatly to a story like The Ark in Space, where they are even more limited in their mobility because they're on a spaceship. So the point I am trying to make is that the setting is a big factor in the overall feel of the story in many ways. I feel like I have to say that because part of my brain thinks that the setting is a bit of a superficial aspect to discuss, but it really isn't, because I find it to be a big factor in the end product of the story that we got. And this does add to the feeling of a little bit of a higher stakes story than usual because it is presented in a setting that is relatively grand and is quite fitting for this serial. As always, I do love our main characters ever so much, they always have delightful moments together and they really are great fun. I mentioned that the Doctor was in a bit of a mood at the start of the story, but that's not really present throughout most of this one. Once he's sucked into this story, he's basically back to his regular old self. It's the sort of thing where he gets so wrapped up in the adventure that he kind of forgets about his troubles. And Sarah Jean is as good as ever, I swear I love her more with each passing story, and her interactions with the Doctor are just delightful. Who is your companion? My companion? Oh... It's just the doctor. No. We travel in time, Mr. Scarman. I'm really from 1980. That is utterly preposterous, Miss Smith. Yes. Sorry. Apparently she was wearing what was supposed to be one of Victoria's outfits. I tried looking for the actual outfit and couldn't find it through a simple Google search. I assume it's not an outfit we actually see on screen. But if it is actually from one of her stories and you happen to know which one, then I'd love to know. Also, this one does a really good job at giving them both an important role in the story. Sometimes serials don't give enough for the companion to do, though that's not usually the case for Sarah Jane, and this one strikes a really good balance and keeps them both very involved in the events of the actual story. Also, the show is doing this thing where the Doctor is attempting, maybe, to try to get Sarah Jane back home, but they get sidetracked on a number of adventures along the way. 
It's quite similar to what happened with the first Doctor, Barbara, and Ian, where they get wrapped up in a bunch of adventures, and before you know it, it's already been a couple of seasons. It's doing a little bit of a different thing, of course, but the approach of a somewhat unreliable pilot definitely draws a comparison. I know it's kind of early, but at this point, I do have to give you a spoiler warning, so be sure to skip to this time as shown on screen to avoid the spoilers for the story, and with that established, let's continue. Sutek I really love the way this story utilizes Sutek and basically everything surrounding his entrapment and how he tries to get out. I love that Sutek has to use other people to escape from his tomb. He's not able to do it on his own, but his mind is powerful enough that he is able to use others to do his bidding for him. One of these is the servant of Sutek who we see throughout most of the story in the form of Marcus and I thought that he worked well as a follower of Sutek because he wasn't a bumbling idiot, he's very competent and he's basically just an extension of Sutek as he is being controlled by him. The actor did a great job of portraying this very calculated and mostly reserved character. Not entirely so, but definitely quite a kept together figure. And I also just like the look of him because he is wearing this white suit, and he has incredibly pale skin with this redness around his eyes that all contributes to him being honestly a little bit corpse-like. And before Sutek's servant takes the form of Marcus, he's in this dark outfit with a face quite similar to that of the mummies, and that design was quite simple but really worked for me, and I also love how there's this character who proclaims himself to be a servant of Sutek, and then Sutek's actual servant is like, what the hell are you talking about? This is my job. And he just kills him and the character never makes an impact on the remainder of the story. That was great. I am a true servant of the great Sutek. I am the servant of Sutek. He needs no other. <laughs> The mummies in this one also worked well as a simple and effective foe. They are again an extension of the threat of Sutek, and they're not really like normal mummies, they are these big lumbering things that move around rather stiffly, and it definitely helped that they were robots because that explained why they don't look necessarily like any ordinary mummy. Or at least the more traditional decayed way that you would expect a mummy to look. I will say that the mummies definitely worked for me in what they were going for within this story, which is to say the mummies weren't the main threat, and they weren't even the only presence in the confined space that our characters are restricted to, but they did serve as a threat and a means to carry out Sutek's bidding. And it's pretty clear that these mummies are actually rather dangerous. They are slow, but they could still kill you. And you can try to run away, but only so far. And I needed to touch on Sutek's servant and the mummies here, not just because I wanted to mention that I liked them, but because I want to talk about the way that Sutek is used as a villain, which is honestly really well done. This story gives you the actual character of Sutek quite sparingly, using other people and things as a means of doing what he cannot. And what this allows for is the story to not only have variety in what it's actually doing by having more than just one singular threat, but also to build up to the way Sutek will be used in part 4 of this serial. I thought it was a really wise choice to do that because it gives the story some real momentum and direction to it as Sutek tries to escape using these other people, and this makes it all the better when we get our first real taste of the character in the end of the story. Part 4 just completely hooked me and pulled me through the entire way, never leaving me bored for a moment. It starts with the Doctor and Sutek's confrontation, which is thoroughly engaging. It did already feel like the story was a bit more dangerous for our main characters than usual, and was operating on a bit of a grander scale. I think this was well exemplified in a great scene where the Doctor shows Sarah Jane what happens to the Earth if they don't stop Sutek. Because if Sutek isn't stopped, he'll destroy the world. But he didn't, did he? I mean, we know the world didn't end in 1911. Do we? Yes, of course we do. All right. If we leave now, let's see what the world will look like in 1980. 1980, Sarah, if you want to get off.
This happened in the second part of the story and was able to give you the understanding that maybe this one is doing a little bit more than your average Doctor Who serial, and it serves as a very effective motivation for them to make a legitimate effort to stop Sutek. But all the same, I never really truly felt the danger of this one until that final part of the story, when Sutek is able to completely overpower the Doctor with nothing but his mind. And I love the way this happens too, because the Doctor has to visit Sutek to break his concentration in order for the explosives to go off, and he does succeed in doing that, thereby completely thwarting his plans, but because he had to go to Sutek to do this, he's left himself exposed to the power of a god. And this story makes it pretty clear that he is a god, and he was imprisoned by other gods, which is why his mind is so powerful and also why he was able to be trapped in this tomb for so long. And I honestly do like when Doctor Who plays with the idea of all-powerful or extremely powerful beings. Sometimes well, sometimes not so well, and in this case I think it's extremely well done. And I love the history that is present from this story, with Horus and the others having worked to trap him, ideally forever, in this prison. The whole shift of the Doctor having just defeated the villain, to him being reduced to completely no power, just like that, was kind of brilliant. And this entire scene between these two characters is really excellent. It very much highlights how incredibly powerful Sutek is, and it isn't as though the Doctor has made a huge mistake in going into the tomb to break his concentration because he has succeeded in his goal, but as a result, he is left entirely to the mercy of a god. So I really like the way that's put together, it feels like smart writing to me because it logically makes sense why the Doctor is doing what he's doing, and he actually succeeds in his goal, but what that leads to is the cliffhanger of part 3, and I thought that was very well presented and thought out, the way that they put it in the story just made sense to me. And the dialogue that Sutek has when talking down to the Doctor is really quite something, and it is performed so excellently by Gabriel Wolfe, who absolutely sells every single word that comes out of his mouth. You truly feel the menace and the power that exudes from this character, and he really stood out to me as one of the best villains I've seen from any of Classic Who. Identify yourself. Just destroy me, Sutek. Nothing else now is left within your power. Identify yourself. It is within my power to choose the manner of your death. I can, if I choose, keep you alive for centuries, racked by the most excruciating pain. I thought that the way Sutek was used, and especially his confrontation with the Doctor, was nothing short of brilliant. I love how the story proceeds as Sutek finds out that he might actually be able to use the Doctor and Sarah Jane to help him escape. And honestly, right from the beginning of this one, I was pretty much instantly hooked. And seeing the Doctor be mind-controlled to take Marcus and the mummies to these puzzles was just immensely enthralling. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. The opening 10 to 15 minutes of this final part are absolutely fantastic, and I found them to be some of the most engaging minutes of Classic Who that I have seen up to this point. And that speaks to how great of a villain they have crafted in Sutek, and how menacing he really feels. It was all just so well put together, and it was fascinating to watch, because I really didn't remember all of the details of how they got out of this situation, and the main character couldn't do anything, he was completely powerless for about half of this. And I think that definitely helped to make this part work so well and be so memorable. Whom do you serve, Time Lord? Sutek. Who holds all life in his hands? Sutek. Who is the bringer of death? Sutek. Venerate his name and obey him in all things. Sutek is supreme. And this tension of the Doctor just not being able to do anything other than Sutek's will culminates in him seemingly dying and Sarah Jane breaking down crying. And it's like this. You know that he's fine, obviously, but seeing Sarah Jane get so broken up in a story that I was already this wrapped up in, 
I don't know, I was just so invested in this entire thing, such that in that moment of the episode, I really felt for Sarah Jane and didn't know what was going to happen next, even though as an audience member, I know the Doctor makes it out okay. And there's this kind of tension-relieving moment, which is weird but in a good way, where the Doctor taps Sarah Jane on her head. Doctor. You're soaking my shirt. Oh, you're alive! Respiratory bypass system, useful in a tight squeeze. Where are we? Um, Pyramid of Mars. And this, I think, serves as quite a good transition into the second part of the episode, because there has been all of this tension and uncertainty, and to have this definitive moment where it does transition into a more light-hearted but still engaging part of the story, I think was quite smart and it is still really entertaining and you definitely feel the urgency of the situation as our main characters work to stop Marcus from breaking the Eye of Horus and releasing Sutik from his tomb. And I did really enjoy this sequence of dealing with these different puzzles. Sarah Jane references Exelon, which makes sense because it was doing a similar thing, but for me this worked far better. The setting is great, the urgency is present as Marcus and his mummies are constantly just ahead of our duo, but it still allows time to have fun little moments and have some clever puzzles. Well, one clever puzzle. When I first saw this story, I was probably right around 10 or 11 years old, and the scene that always stood out to me was when Sarah Jane got trapped and the doctor had to choose which button to press. One would kill her, one would save her, and there were two guardians, one of which lies, and one tells the truth. And I always thought the way he figured out the right button was so clever, because obviously I never would have thought of that as a kid, but I was able to make sense of it when the doctor explained it, and it's just a really fun kind of puzzle that kind of makes you feel smart for understanding it, at least that was the case when I was much younger. And it is still quite a fun sequence to see how the doctor figures it out, and I think it holds up well, but I'll probably always remember this scene because of how much I loved it as a child. If I were to ask your fellow guardian the question, which switch would he indicate? I see. So if you're the true guardian, that must be the death switch. And if you're the automatic lie, you'd be trying to mislead me, so that must still be the death switch. Therefore, this has to be the one we want. There's also this lovely little moment when they're solving where the doctor pushes Sarah Jane behind him just in case he's wrong and it blows up in his face. It's just a nice tiny moment that I loved, and the doctor and Sarah Jane seem to have so many of those great moments together. They're just an incredible duo, and I'm never going to stop saying that. In case I'm wrong. I'm right. And as we do get into the final moments of this story, things ramp up as the Eye of Horus is destroyed and the Doctor and Sarah Jane have to rush back to Earth to stop Sutek from escaping. And in fact, just as he is making his escape from his tomb, the Doctor kills him. I mean, it is possible that he survived, maybe somehow, but within this story, the Doctor has to take Sutek out before he can destroy Earth. And he absolutely makes the right call. And interestingly, the Doctor points out that because of the radio wave delay from Mars to Earth, he didn't travel in time to take care of Sutek, he just went to Earth, which was kind of a neat touch, I think. Now, I don't think there's a story reason that he couldn't have done that, but it is presented as though he couldn't have traveled back in time. Take that with a grain of salt though, I could be wrong about that detail. I also liked the final moments that we leave this story on. After having gone through the whole ordeal that was this serial and having defeated Sutek, they leave the burning building and the credits roll. It's just a nice place to leave this one at. So I have talked about the bulk of the story, but there's also some random things I really want to bring up, like the scenes where the Doctor is dressed as a mummy, which by the way, is actually Tom under the costume, and that was kind of fun, seeing them attempt to blow up Sutek's miniature pyramid because there was a fair bit going on. The Doctor, disguised as a robot mummy, carries the explosives, 
nearly gets caught by Marcus, Sarah Jane has to set off the explosives, and right when she does manage to do that, it actually fails because Sutek is able to hold back the explosion. I thought that was a really entertaining scene, which did lead quite well into the end of the story. Oh, I also love this moment. This looks like it. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the matter? Not enough? Sweaty gelignite is highly unstable. One good sneeze could set it off. Sorry. No sign of any detonators or fuses? No. No. Nothing else. Perhaps he sneezed. Overall, I found this one to be incredibly enthralling and enjoyable with an excellent and truly menacing villain in the form of Sutek, who really helped in making this story what it was. Our main characters are once again beyond lovely together and are an absolute delight to watch throughout, this one moves at a great pace and does a really good job at building to its fantastic final part. I thought that this was a splendid story and I'm going to give Pyramids of Mars a rating of 9.25 out of 10. Well that does it for this somewhat bloated review. I hope you enjoyed listening to me get into all the many things I liked about this story and I hope that you leave some of your thoughts on this one down below. I am very interested to hear thoughts on this serial. I expect it to be largely positive, but I look forward to reading all of your thoughts regardless of whether or not you liked it. If you join me again this coming Sunday, I should be bringing you some sort of ranking or top 10. It really just depends on how much time I'm going to have, so we might just move on right into the fourth serial and skip over whatever ranking I would have put there. We'll see, but regardless, before too long, whether it is this coming Sunday or the Sunday after, there will be a new video, but we'll just have to wait and see what ends up happening. So I hope to see you around soon for more Doctor Who videos and rankings, as well as reviews of other shows occasionally. But if not, that is absolutely fine, so long as you know that I appreciate your time here today. And with that said, thank you very much for watching, take care, and have a lovely week.